So my name is Sira. The shorter version of it is Sira. The full version is that that you see right there, and it's quite long. So this work started off when I was a postdoc at the Food and Drug Administration in DC. Um, and we're trying to attack this question of how the tyrosine kinase inhibitors lead to uh, heart toxicities. There are hypotheses, but nobody really understands the actual mechanism at the molecular level in human. So these are the questions that we're trying to answer and how FDA and the Office of Clinical Pharmacology fits into TransSmart is that when we started this project, we were looking for integrating the pre-competitive data and we have um, participants from uh, big pharmas. So uh, a little bit, you will see more of the ontology thing later in this presentation, but in, in, the, in drug discovery research, we are used to MEDRA vocabularies and we know that MEDRA is not a comprehensive structured ontology. It gives you a list of words that are used as the standard words, but then again, it doesn't come equipped with the structure that can be semantically linked to the other um, knowledge out there. So we, we first try to match the middle terms to the ontology of adverse events, and for what that we obtain for from this project, by querying the FDA adverse event reporting system database, we try to use these five TKIs, mine for the significant adverse events, and see if those adverse events are not already in the ontology of adverse events. We then complement the OAE, the ontology, to have those cross-reference back to Medra. Why do we need to do that? Because in the bigger picture of this project, we're trying to understand the key question of what is the molecular mechanisms of the tyrosine kinase inhibitor induced cardiotoxicity. There are three parallel workflow here, as you see here. The leftmost here, um, we were trying to use the MACE analysis, the molecular adverse events, uh, something and something. I apologize, I don't have it at the top of my mind. Um, but that will give you a hypothesis um, gene interaction network as well, but that would be mining from the existing databases. On the other side here, on the right hand here, you, we had the human curators at the Office of Clinical Pharmacology looking into what drug targets that can be manually verified as being highly associated to the TK-induced cardiotoxicity. And the part that I am presenting as the key methodology for this talk is how can we use ontology to help you mine the novel information from the publications. So this one is the human curated network that we had the curators uh, worked on this at the Office of Clinical Pharmacology. We then used Cytoscape to expand out this network and then we realized that there are a few uh, functionalities, the, the biological processes that are highly related to the gene. There were about 111, 150 genes in, in this um, human curated list. Why is that important? Because when we find the common genes among all these three example biological uh, processes, we found that each of the genes, there are big genes, ERP1, ERP2, ERK1 and 2, RAS, MAPK, STAT, JAK, STAT pathways. These are really the, the everything housekeeping genes. But can we learn from this? So these are just the, 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 the different biological processes that the genes have in common. Now, then we move on to if we want to find the new information from the PubMed literature, what do we have to do? Because PubMed literature is full of noises and um, a lot of the NLP tools, they don't produce the precisions or the sensitivity that, that we really want. You might end up with 200, 300 genes or gene interaction pairs that don't at the end of the day qualify for anything. So we investigated um, a methodology called CONDO, the centrality analysis, but in this slide I'm showing you that 
The ontology of adverse event defines the relational information structure for systems drug safety research because it has a lot of the structure that links to, for example, we have adverse event one is associated or is the evidence of adverse event two. When you look at Medra, for example, other than it having the list of vocabularies, it also have the, the clinician curated list of SMQs, the standard Medra queries, where you have a group of symptoms that may indicate a bigger picture of, of um, a syndromic adverse event. But those might not necessarily be highly related in terms of it's in the same anatomical system or it's in the same um, biological processes, so for example, cancer or a Lee-Fraumani syndrome, when you, when you take this disease, for example, it actually is a group of other symptoms and diseases and it can appear everywhere in your body. So Medra offers that Medra SMQs that we capture that inside the ontology of adverse event via the is evidence of relationship. Um, so why do we have to go to ontology of adverse event when we want to do the mining. Because if we can cross-reference that with ontology uh, of adverse events terminology, then OAE has that linkages back to the gene ontology biological processes. And that's why we decided to use the ontology of adverse event in mining the PubMed literature and then tagging those genes back to the biological processes. So. In, at the FDA's use case, we take these drugs, the tuximab, trastuzumab, dasatinib, imatinib, lapatinib, which is the cancer drug, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, we, when we did that, we found that we have 31 cardiotoxicity terms. We tagged those 31 cardiotoxicity terms that were standardized back to ontology of adverse event, and then we mined PubMed on these 31 cardiotoxicity terms. But when you look into FAIR's database, you also have other co-occurrences of other adverse events that are non-cardiotox specific. But we also want to look at that because cardio, uh, symptoms of heart failure, for example, you can have edema, you can have inflammation at various parts of the body, and that's not highly specific to the heart, but that again, it is a symptom that may, may indicate the heart failure or other cardiotoxicities. So in those, we have 72 non-cardiotoxicity adverse events that then we use this centrality analysis NLP to mine PubMed literature to find the candidate gene pair. So what it will find is it will find gene one associated to gene two, and then we use those gene pairs to construct the bigger picture of the gene network. Um, so we found that the gene network associated logical processes that came up with really high score from linking back to OE and back to the gene ontology is that we had regulation of program cell death. We have response to external stimulus and then re regulation of oxidoreductase activities in the different subsets of the mine, the PubMed that we mine. So we have five TKIs associated. We have cardiotox, but non-TKI specific that comes up high in this group. We have cardiotox, non-TKI specific, also having the oxidoreductase activities. And this is just a screenshot, an example of the gene biological processes that come up as significant in this study. And this is how the FDA Predictox project fits into the whole Transmart. We came up with this diagram, integrating a lot of data from all perspectives of looking at the drug safety and the pre-competitive data, animal models, toxicology, pre-clean, clean, and the experimental data, and we were asking ourselves, what platform can we use to, to do all this? And we are right now investigating Transmart. We started looking into Transmart, and in fact, I think um, we actually have a Transmart instance at the FDA Predict Talks project. So the heart of it now, I might be going, I might have been going a little bit fast in the beginning, but here is where I want to pay special attention to. 
So centrality and ontology-based analysis of literature my network is the NLP methodology that used the information of ontologies of your choice, which in this case we chose ontology of the first event to expand the search in the public literature. But we don't just use the co-occurrencing of the two words in the same sentence. We actually went as far ahead to do the complex natural language processing to construct this gene interaction network. And the point of that is that we don't want to look into the existing databases. We want to find if we can identify the new information from PubMed literature. And that is very challenging because PubMed is very high in noise. So this is the heart and soul of Corndall. It's purely computer science. And we had really good NLP person to do this. Um, so two genes in the same sentence of PubMed. We mine the sentence that we categorize it as the sentence belonging to the terms that come from the TKI cardiotoxicity, terms that come from the non-cardiotoxicity list, terms that has the cardiotoxicity term, sorry, sentence that have the cardiotoxicity terms, but not relating to the TKI. So we have the four groups of that, which I will show you in the results here. But when you identify those sentences, we actually go back and see if we can identify any two gene symbols that appear in that same sentence. But if we just do the co-occurrence of the two gene symbols, then we'll be really high in noise. So these are the the four categories of score, we have four columns of score that we have the fifth column of the normalized score combined all those four columns together. So in these four columns, we have the simplest form of it is number of neighbors, how important I am. If I am a celebrity, I have a lot of friends, so I would get high score if I were a gene. So the second one is the eigenvector centrality is OK, I might not be Lindsay Lohan, but if I know Lindsay Lohan, if I know Taylor Swift, then I might be important too. So that one is counting how many celebrity friends do I have. Then the third, the third one of the two genes in a pair is that inverse sum, how, how central I am. If you have the short test distance between one gene to every gene that you can link to, then you, you are probably important. So that's what the third one is. Then proportion of the short test part to all the pairs. So if I am here and I try to connect to everyone in this room, how, how big am I in this network? So after we calculate these four categories of scores for each gene in interaction pair, then we have the normalized score in the fifth column to then yield us with the results that look sort of like that. So we did the quality control between the keywords and using the ontology terms. So if keywords, we just throw in the 31 term for the cardiotoxicity specific and the 72 term for the non-cardiotox terms. But using ontology of adverse event, you actually expand your search by looking at the relations between the 31 term and what are the children term of that terms? And it's not just the subclass of relationships that we're looking at in the ontology of a person. In the ontology, you also have the information of what is the anatomical location that these specific adverse event manifest in. So we actually account in those pieces of information as well. So now you are expanding your, your, your query without introducing too much noise into it. So we actually looked at the top five, top 10, top 15, and top 20. I apologize that you probably don't see very clearly on here, but I've put my slides online, so you will be able to see these results as well. I've shown you the past four slides to, to show you that it's actually up to, to you to restrict, constrain, or relax your how many genes you want to cover in, in, in your network. If you expand it out, you might find something new, something interesting, but the trade-off is that you probably will encounter with more noise than if you restricted it to really small network. But when looking at the really small network, you probably don't get new information as much as you wish you would in mining PubMed. 
So I think in our study we did select the top 20 for the TKI specific and cardio talks in that in that one box to show in the example in the next few slides. Now, if you remember at the beginning, I gave you the the a diagram of some machine generated network. Centrality analysis NLP network and the human curate, curated network. In the human curated network, we actually have learned something. There were hypotheses out there, and Tom Force has done tremendous amount of work on looking at the rodent model for the heart toxicity by um, the TKIs. And he, had, he, he came up with this diagram as the hypothesis for how the cancer treatment may lead to the cardiac adverse event. And his, his network looks impressive, but it was done in, in mouse. So animals are not human, and, and, and you're in drug pharmaceutical research, and you know that. These are just some examples of how he carefully constructed his network. He actually counted all the ion channels, all the other receptors, and how the drug interacts with your body. So if you go back to his paper here, he actually tries to explain both PK and PD of TKIs when leading to cardiotoxicity. And the only reason that I brought up those few slides is that in this diagram, this is the merged version of what the centrality analysis found and what Thomas Force hypothesized in his mouse study. So the green ovals here are things that we found in with centrality analysis. The pale yellow boxes and symbols here are things that were hypothesized by Tom Force. And the, the pink ovals here are the, the, the link in information that I actually went back and looked at some paper and, and tried to, to, to understand if we can find some connections back to what Tom Forrest explained. Maybe, maybe it's a good sign that we might have found something new and interesting from mining public literature with this method. This is the some legends. So we pick, yeah, I think this is top. 20 most significant score from the TKIs and cardiotoxicity specific column. And then these are the genes that you saw out there in the, the, the green boxes. And I've touched upon that a little bit, that it, it's the ontology work that, that can expand your search in PubMed without introducing too much noise. but Ontology is a work in progress. Any biomedical ontologies, you actually go back and forth between the ontology developers and the users of that ontology because no ontologies are complete because you find new discoveries every day. And as you discover more information and more knowledge, you actually would have to go back and refine your ontology. And ontology of adverse event is also the same case. Placing ontology of adverse event in the bigger picture. When you want to play, to to link, I've, I've introduced linking the ontology of adverse events back to the gene ontology. But when you do big project like TransSmart and Predict Talks in this case, you actually look at chemical compounds, you look at animal toxicology, you look at diseases, phenotypes, drugs, biological processes, adverse events. One might argue that you can see disease phenotypes as the adverse events, but in the ontology world it makes a difference where ontology of adverse event accounts in that you actually have to have some kind of the medical intervention that precedes the occurrence of the clinical observation of the adverse events. So in this piece of work we actually try to piece together three ontologies we have the blue boxes here for adverse events from the ontology of adverse events. We're looking at the biological processes from the gene ontology. And anatomical location is another piece that, that when you look at disease, it don't always promise you the solution, but it gives you a good clue of how to actually link from edema to heart to the different parts of the body. 
and placing this in the bigger picture, you actually do need another type of ontology to, to put the linkages between the different ontologies. And that is a separate presentation that I'm giving tomorrow. So finally, this is what OAE looks like. Before this project started, our cardiac um, adverse event weren't very, in, uh, weren't very comprehensive. But after it got expanded with this FDA cardiotox study, we actually manually created each and every one of them. And this is just the, the primary classification of it. If you actually go into the file, you would have all the attributes of, for example, it would be linked to the biological processes. Um, so I think it was, hmm. for example, hemorrhage would be linked back to hemorrhage hematopoietic systems. It would then be linked to inflammation and bleeding and something in, inside the ontology. So those are the, the rules, the logical rules and axioms inside the ontology that when you do the big data integration, those matter. Those are the piece that, that you need to link the different types of information together. And I'd like to end it with this diagram again. Can Transmart answer this problem? And that's what I'm really excited about, finding out how ontologies will be incorporated in Transmart. And I have to thank everyone here, especially in Bill EBI, where I am working at now, because they are fully funding my trip here. And I'm presenting FDA work. <laughs> so, so these are the people doing all the NLP work, especially Dr. Asuchan Oscar here. Um, she did all the NLP work in, in this study. And I think I have a few minutes to take questions, unless I have been doing a really fast presentation on this. No. Um, are there any questions? Uh, everyone is just as lost. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Ontologies are one of those things. It's an appealingly technical topic. It's... That's, uh, Sometimes hard to. It's not an easy concept to yeah. grasp, yeah. And, but 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 you you need it. For example, this predict talks I was brought in for ontology infrastructure of it because we are looking to integrate in a lot of pre-competitive data, yeah. and uh, the FI classification system in Transmart one point right now does not really accommodate linking in a lot of the individuals organization of the files, and if you don't properly link in the individual files, then the metadata management of it becomes more challenging. So that's that's the example that I'm giving tomorrow for how do we build a project-specific ontology. Maybe I should have started with ontology on what I want. We've also been working on ontologies for a long time, so I can very well appreciate what you are saying. Uh, I have a question regarding the complexity of ontologies. Uh, as you can imagine, the people who develop the ontologies are familiar with it and are specialists. And downstream, if you want to analyze the data and you ask, uh, let's say, an average level biologist to work with it, it'll become pretty challenging to work with it. And that's one of the main reasons why gene ontology started developing a slim version of GO because it had too many terms, it was too much into detail. Do you see the same thing in some of your ontologies that there is a need to make a slim version of it? So actually there is um, a few questions in that questions. Um, working with biologists, there is definitely a challenge when it's, it's a highly collaborative in nature, but then you, you have on ontologists who have a different level of ontology understanding than the biologist. So we actually have developed a tool called Webulus that, that we, we, we just take in the spreadsheets and then we convert that spreadsheets into a proper ontology, even though there are a few softwares like that. Those softwares didn't answer the axiomatization problem when you build the proper ontology. I have a few slides on that tomorrow if you'd like to come to that talk. Second, gene ontology is, is very big. It's, it's 
three main ontologies in itself, right? It has the the components, the functional uh, pieces, and then it has the biological processes. Not one person would see a full gene ontology at any point of time because it, it is built on the go every night. Gene ontology slim was created because, yes, there were so many classes in there, and then the challenge came in when when people want to computationally use it, it's too big. It crashes your computer. So gene ontology is very gene specific. It will describe just genes. While on the other hand, projects like projects using Transmarts, it it tries to, to to arch over many things. And that is more like the experimental factor ontology, where we import a lot of terms from many ontologies to try to put the linkages between the different pieces of data together. And yes, there is a need to develop the SLIM, and we have a pipeline in place that we will generate the SLIM of EFO when, when that's done. So this is actually the use case that I'm presenting tomorrow on this pipeline that I use EFO to be the overarching mother ontology to build the predict tox ontology. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right. Thanks. Well, thank you, and we look forward to uh, tomorrow's uh, topic as well. Um, Ah, uh, yeah, okay, good. Um, so let's see, we have a, a few minutes before our, our next presentation is actually intended to be with the entire group. Um, I suspect that it will take five or ten minutes before everyone congregates back here, to be honest, so so I would uh, allow a few minutes for that as well. So, um, so let's wait until we can uh, reconvene the whole group together here. Thanks.
так это нельзя. everyone um, uh, we're in the home stretch now I can uh, promise you that um, next up we have a, a short presentation from David Peruk from Dexter uh, a gold sponsor of the conference so we'd like to thank him and following that we're going to have a, a summary of the day I'm not sure what you know what exactly that's going to be. yeah and then uh, if you can hang in there just a little longer it'll be time for the poster session. So with that, I'll turn it over to David. Thank you. Yes. It's okay? Yes. So um, good afternoon, uh, everybody. So I'm David Peyrud, the CEO of Dexter. So Dexter, it's um, a young and innovative uh, company uh, that uh, is a software editor, and we are based in Toulouse in the south of France. So um, uh, my um, uh, two other colleagues, so Erwan and Florian, uh, who are very here today, um, and, uh, and myself have been uh, involved into a lot of um, uh, different uh, research projects and transnational research projects uh, in different uh, biopharmaceutical companies. And uh, these experiences, um, uh, these experiences have, involved, have um, uh, inspired uh, the creation of Dexter and the software we are developing. So as a software editor, so uh, we are developing and promoting um, a software that is Inquiro, it's the name. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, Inquiro is um, a scientific knowledge management system that helps uh, scientists of pharmaceutical, uh, biopharmaceutical industry uh, to manage uh, and uh, valorize uh, the big volume of unstructured data that uh, are generated uh, by the research team on a daily basis. So, um, uh, Inquiro, in fact, is, um, uh, uses um, uh, um, an innovative approach uh, by the systematic uh, use and exploitation of uh, scientific uh, metadata and, um, and uh, based on the scientific uh, metadata, um, the, oh, sorry, <laughs> and um, so and uh, the, the software is also uh, clearly designed um, to uh, to um, to be deployed for a team or a collaboration or um, a unit. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, our customer um, uh, currently uh, uses um, Inquiro in different uh, business scientific business cases, and today we have um, uh, one cases where uh, Inquiro uh, is used um, with Transmart. So in fact, uh, um, is used together and um, uh, together all unstructured files. Uh, then after to prepare that uh, for the curation process and uh, finally to load them uh, this, uh, this file uh, into, uh, into Transmart. So uh, this is uh, an, uh, ongoing, uh, an ongoing task with uh, this customer and um, uh, if you are interested you can see a poster that uh, will be presented so in one hour now uh, by um, Annick Pellereau from Sanofi and Nehwan David here from Dexter. Uh, so um, a presentation uh, poster uh, where a part of uh, this ongoing task um, are, is presented. Um, so um, so uh, um, we have a different, uh, we have a, a developer team in, uh, in Dexter um, and especially uh, Charlotte who is a, a developer um, who have 
contributed a lot on the on the Transmart application uh, and continue to contribute on the Transmart application. Um, but during the last 12 months, uh, so the, the Dexter team has focus uh, more on the on the development of the software in Quero but uh, by um, we plan really to um, or it's a, an ongoing um, uh, process now we are increasing the number of the developers of the team and uh, clearly the goal to uh, to contribute and to uh, to contribute more on the on the platform uh, with our our developer that's our skill and uh, and uh, and uh, and good for to develop on those technologies so um, uh, finally, I would like to say um, that uh, uh, Dexter and myself are very happy to um, uh, to, uh, to participate as a sponsor uh, to the success uh, of, of this event. And um, and finally, so if you are, are interested, um, so Florian, Erwan, or myself, uh, we are there to exchange on on our our Inquiro, on Dexter on uh, to. If you are if you are interested, we we are ready to to exchange with you. So thank you. Thanks, David, and thanks again for uh, for your sponsorship. It's uh, it's great to have this level of support from the vendor community. Um, Is there one other than that? We're going to need that. Yeah. Yeah, we okay, can. we'll use that one. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to practice my my uh, skills as the CEO to do some delegation here. Okay. <laughs> so I don't have any slides. So. Okay. Sounds good. So uh, I think it's been a, a pretty exciting day. So we're here to do the summary. I see they put 45 minutes for the summary. I'm not going to go that long. Uh, it's been quite a busy day. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to attend all the sessions, but I think, uh, number one, I'd just like to thank our hosts um, who uh, have done a great job today in providing the refreshments and the facilities and everything. So thank you very much to the NKI and CT on Trade. So it's been a, a great day from that perspective. Um, in addition, uh, I really I really enjoyed uh, uh, Emil's uh, keynote presentation. That was a fantastic overview. It's, it's sometimes we get focused as an open source software foundation on the technology, and it's great to see the needs and the applications uh, that people are using and driving, and putting those together. I think it's uh, it's important to to bring you know scientists, technologists uh, together, and we were talking a little bit at the board meeting that we just had about uh, this concept of of customers versus users, and I think that's a very important concept is when you think about what people are trying to do and what they need to get done. Um, yeah, we need to facilitate that. So that was fantastic. So let me uh, just take a look here. What I'd like to do, again, practicing my, my delegation skills here, is call upon the chairs of each of the sessions. I'm looking around to see if I see Ramon. Is Ramon around? You want to give a, a quick summary? Can you run the mic up to him? You want to give a quick summary of, of your session and uh, some of your key thoughts there? I'm putting people on the spot, but I guess that's what I yeah, do, that's, right? Uh, that's exactly what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> now now everybody else is forewarned, though. <laughs> but everyone was there, right? So I think uh, this morning session, um, you gave a nice overview of, uh, well, Gerrit started off with uh, introducing why we're actually all uh, here at this meeting. Yeah. Um, you gave a great uh, follow-up and uh, summary on... Uh, to what happened uh, after the an ARPA meeting. Um, I think uh, one of the key things that followed was the discussion that was triggered by a case uh, on uh, how to go further with Transmart and uh, well I think that discussion is uh, ongoing during the meeting. Yeah. Um, we had a Introduction from um, from Rancho, um, and as you mentioned, we had the the, the keynote lecture from uh, from Emil. Um, I think you summarized it already, uh, Keith. That yeah. um, there are actually the use case or one of the potential use cases of how Transmart uh, can be used 
has been put forward and I think what well that's my personal opinion I think that we need a lot of different use cases uh, to show how Transmart can be used so I extrapolate a little bit to, to let's say my own agenda uh, the research mm -hmm. data that we generate in our group and the research data that are generated in the other projects from uh, the CTMM projects in the Netherlands the research projects that are generated by uh, many of the companies I think it would be worthwhile to see what is the size of those projects what do those projects really need within Transmart how do the users actually use these projects so when we are discussing how big or how small Transmart should be my question would also be how many uh, different projects different sizes of projects are actually uh, in need of Transmart and when we make a map of that that actually might help a little bit mm -hmm. to uh, to see how the discussions on how to go forward um, yeah so great that would be my uh, very brief summary of this morning session fantastic thank you very much I, I would add to your, your statements I think one thing that was really um, intriguing to me in, in Emil's presentation is looking at the ecosystem you know from the outside not from the inside. We tend to look a little heads down and look a little inside and look outside. But looking from the outside in, we see that it's a very complex and growing ecosystem that we need to be aware of where we fit and how we fit and who we interact with. And that echoes to some discussions we were just having at the board meeting uh, where we need to get more people engaged in the community committee. So that's where we have this outreach of working with others and, and facilitating that. And Sherry was making a statement of please people, you know, Every, every gold member should have a representative on the community committee. Every silver member should choose that one as their one committee. Um, but anybody who wants to get engaged in what we're doing in the community should, should really help there. But that's, that was a great thing. The other thing that I was kind of struck at is we have to get from the point where being able to choose that personalized treatment for a patient is the rare exception to where it's the norm. And that's the challenge for us there. So I, that was really quite good. So thanks, thanks Ramon. Um, Let's see, the afternoon session, we had two sessions, right? So, Keith, I think you chaired the, uh, would you give us a quick summary? Um, so, yeah, I would say, <clears throat> excuse me, for the afternoon session, um, we had just, well, every, everyone saw the presentation from Dan Hausman. Um, I would say if I were to map the presentations onto the three Cs, I mean, we pretty much stuck to the community and content committees, if I... Uh, map them uh, roughly to, to those uh, axes. Um, we stayed away for the most part from code. I think we got a little technical when we talked about the, um, the GSK project and how, how it was that uh, they were able, Rancho Biosciences was able to map, uh, was able to use the existing schema by what I would call hijacking, uh, you know, one of the concepts that's in the, in the, in the uh, schema. Um, to represent time points uh, for biosensor data. You know, it's, it's not necessarily the most natural way to do things. I think it's something that uh, would be good if the schema addressed more directly. Um, so that was a bit on the, on the technical side, but it was a good example of, uh, I think, of the flexibility of the platform. So when you need to do something, uh, it is possible, uh, and that's reassuring. Um, for me, a, a couple of the other talks, Dan's and then uh, Karsten's, we're really getting at sort of the heart of the question of, you know,